welcome to Industry Focus, the podcast that dives into a different sector of the stock market every day. Today is Thursday, October 25th, and we're discussing Bach and Shale. I'm your host, Nick Seipel, and today I'm joined by Motley Fool contributor Matt Delalo via Skype. How you doing, Matt? Good. How are you? I'm doing well, Matt. You know, uh, we got Halloween coming up around the corner. Uh, you got any plans for that, or what's going on for you on that end? You know, my wife and I, we tend to turn the lights off and just watch movies and avoid all the trick-or-treaters, so that's our plan. <laughs> I, I, hear, I hear where you're coming from. I still haven't figured out what I'm going to wear, but uh, I'm sure it will make me look uh, ridiculous for sure. Yeah. Uh, so today, Matt, we're talking about the Bach and Shale formation, and you know this is something that, you know you, you follow pretty closely. Um, first off, off the bat, uh, let's just you know tell our listeners you know what the Bach and Shale is, where it's located. So, you know it's in, it underlies parts of Montana, North Dakota, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Uh, oil was first discovered there in 1951. Um, but production efforts really struggled for the next 50 years until fracking came on board. And do you want to talk about kind of how the Bakken's evolved over the past decade or so, and what fracking has made possible there? You know, when it comes to oil recovery and those sorts of things. Yeah. So oil companies knew that there was oil there; they just didn't know how to get it out. So um, as they figured out how to do shale plays, the, they started out in the uh, Barnett Shale of Texas and then moved it up to the Marcellus. They figured out that combining Horizontal drilling with horizontal, with hydraulic fracturing was like the key to unlocking these things. So they tested it out in the Bakken. Um, that was like 2003, 2004. Uh, Continental Resources, they were the leaders out there, and they figured it out. And it's just taken off since then. They've been tweaking the process, but um, it has been just phenomenal how much oil they've been able to pull out of that um, region, mostly North Dakota. Um, they pulled out some from Montana. Canada's got a little bit, but North Dakota just been on fire. Yeah, and, and just to illustrate these numbers, you know, for our listeners. So in 1995, the U.S. Geological Survey estimated that the Bakken contained 151 million uh, barrels of recoverable oil. Um, uh, recently, uh, in September 2018, Continental Resources, which you mentioned, one of the largest players in the Bakken, which we'll discuss later on on the show, estimated that there were 30 to 40 billion barrels of recoverable oil. Um, in, in the Bakken. So, you see that's a, a, a ridiculous increase in, in the recoverable oil, which has really just been made possible by this hydro- hydraulic fracturing. Um, and I, I think the stat that I saw, which just blew my mind, is that North Dakota is the number two state uh, in the United States uh, for oil production, um, which is yeah. mind-boggling. You know, everybody thinks about Alaska and Texas, but you know, over there in North Dakota, uh, this, these shale oil plays have really, really opened up. Uh, do you want to talk about what's the Bakken looking like today? What's the production profile, and what are the prospects going forward? Yeah, so because oil prices dipped, that really hurt the Bakken. Uh, it had pretty high costs, like $12 million to drill a well. So as oil prices went down, companies just didn't have the money to drill. That caused production to fall off during, uh, what, 2016, 2017. So after peaking, I think it peaked around 1.2 million barrels in 2015, it dipped um, below a million for a while. But with oil prices rising and um, companies were able to cut their costs, They've just really started to ramp up drilling up there. And the latest I saw was 1.3 million barrels, is the latest peak. And a lot of that has come because they've figured out better ways to drill wells. They're drilling them faster, they're drilling them um, more productive, they're using more sand um, as they're fracturing. Um, so that's just allowed them to produce more oil per well, which has just um, made it so much more profitable. Um, I saw a stat from Continental Resources back in 2011. It was like less than 20% return on a well. Now it's 175% return on a well. So it's just a huge, huge um, gain in how much they can make on these wells. So that's what's driving this production. And they think it could reach 2 million barrels a day eventually. Yeah, which uh, that that is, I mean, that's twenty percent of Saudi Arabia's oil production. That's that's a large chunk of oil coming from you know a relatively you know under underappreciated uh, oil play that up there in North Dakota. Um, you know, we were talking before the show that you know as a result of this big spike in oil production in the Bakken, that you know we've seen some pipeline capacity become a little strained. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and what risks that may uh, po- pose for the play? Uh, you know, over the next twelve months or so. Yeah, pipelines have been an issue in the Bakken since the beginning. Um, a couple of years ago, there was an, uh, they were trying to build the it was called the Bakken pipeline. There's two pipelines by Energy Transfer pi- Partners that would move oil out of the Bakken, but it's very controversial. Um, made the news. Uh, it was delayed for a while. They finally got that online, and that's really helped um, boost production lately. However, that's basically full. So initially, they, it was a 470,000 barrel a day pipeline. 
And it's currently over 500,000 barrels a day because they've been able to make some slight changes. However, um, you know, with it basically full, they, they're, they're asking shippers if they want um, to take some more capacity. And if they do, then they're going to make some changes, add some pumping stations to kind of boost that pipeline. And in addition to that, you've got natural gas um, that they used to flare up there, just burn it off because there's no pipelines. But uh, now they've got the, the processing plants and the pipelines to get that out. However, again, that's filling up. So Kinder Morgan, they, they mentioned that um, they're looking at some natural gas pipeline possibilities, maybe taking it down the Rockies, maybe going to California. And the third thing that they produce out there is natural gas liquids, NGLs. Uh, uh, one oak they're in the process of building the elk creek pipeline which will move ngls down the rockies and also pick up some from powder river basin so there's a lot of pipelines that they're building there's a lot of pipelines that need to be built um it's just a huge opportunity especially for income investors that are looking for growth and income pipeline companies that are building the bakken um, could be pretty big in the future Exactly. I mean, we're seeing all this investment from the pipeline players. Just goes to show that I mean, over the long term, they're they're really expecting uh, oil to continue to come out of this region and, and for production to perhaps uh, continue going going forward. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so let's talk about some of the some of the players in the Bakken uh, that investors maybe should be aware of, maybe should pay attention to for their portfolios. We, and to start off, let's talk about Continental Resources. It's one of the largest players in the region. Uh, they claim to be the largest leaseholder in the Bakken. They also have leading positions in Oklahoma and the Scoop Stack plays. Uh, what's going on with Continental Resources right now? What should investors pay attention to? Yeah, they they've been kind of the first mover out there, so they were able to gobble up a bunch of land back in the you know early part of the the drilling boom and. They've been able to just you know steadily drill that, and they have so much um, drillable land out there that they can grow and grow and grow. Um, this year, between their Bakken land and their stock scoop play, they think they can uh, grow production. Um, it's like twenty to twenty-four percent, which is phenomenal for a company that size. And in addition to that, they can produce cash flow. You know, back um, during the drilling boom, companies were just drilling as fast as they could. They were taking on debt, um, issuing new stock, whatever they could to drill more wells. Well, now with returns as good as they are, companies like Continental are able to just produce excess cash and still grow fast, which is great for investors because now they're actually making profits. They're able to use that money. Um, in Continental's case, they might use it to uh, institute a dividend, which you know is crazy for shale companies to actually be paying a dividend, but that's what they're looking at. Um, they could buy, possibly buy back stock. They're also using that money to do some creative things. Uh, one of the things they're looking at is a, or they're they're doing a mineral partnership with uh, Franco Nevada, which is a golden silver streaming company. Uh, it's a two hundred twenty million dollar deal, which will basically give them funds to drill more wells, so offset their capital program. But they can use this as a, another growth vehicle. So there's just a lot that they're doing out there. Um, well run. Their founder has been one of the champions of shale. Harold um, Ham. He's constantly on, you know, places like CNBC talking about how great the Bakken can be, and he's really done a good job putting together a company that's geared towards that play. Yeah, and, and Matt, let's talk a little bit more about this partnership with Franco Nevada because it was really interesting to me. I, I saw, you know, one of the more recent uh, Continental Resources earnings calls. Uh, John Hart, which is their CFO and treasurer, said that this is a first of its kind uh, partnership between, you know, a, a streaming uh, type uh, resource company and a and a shale producer. And it's really, you know, they're kind of partnering together to where uh, Franco Nevada is going to help purchase the new leases. Uh, while Continental is gonna is gonna work along with them to choose the new places that, that they they're interested in drilling, and they'll get some investment from Franco Nevada to help help supply that. What what do you think uh, when you look at this deal? Do you think this this is something that could become a trend more long term for other shell players, or what kind of opportunities do you think this provides differently than the way things have been done in the past? Uh, it looks like it could be a trend. It's the it's the second type of these companies that's formed. The other is Viper Energy. Uh, which Diamondback Energy formed a couple of years ago, and it's they've used it as it's kind of like an MLP. They they've converted to a corporation, but where they would drop down these royalty acres, or Viper would acquire these royalty acres, and they would use that to generate cash flow that they paid to investors. So it's kind of like an income producing vehicle. So in Continental Resource case, they're going to use this initially as a growth vehicle. They're going to try to 
uh, buy up some more of these royalties and build up a company that they could turn into an IPO. Um, they could spit it off. It, they have a lot of options for it, but it, it's a, another way to raise cash. It's oil companies always need money, even though they're generating cash flow now. Um, oil prices take a dip or they decide to grow faster, they'll need that cash sooner because they're always drilling more wells. It costs lots and lots of money to do that. So it's a way to do that and maybe free up some cash flow now that they could use buy back stock, pay down debt, something like that. So I do think it'll probably become a, a trend to watch for investors, especially those that like income, because that's what these would be geared towards. Exactly. I mean, it's it's a novel way to raise cash. And you know, when it comes to the energy game, uh, cash is king, it seems to be the case. Uh, Absolutely. Let, let's talk. Let's talk about uh, another player uh, in in the uh, the Bakken region. That's Hess Corporation, um, ticker H E S. Um, and and Hess, you know, they they have some plays going on in the Bakken. They're also involved um, in Guyana. They partnered with Exxon uh, to to drill one of the largest offshore discoveries in recent memory. Um, there, do you want to talk about what's going on with Hess and what's going on in the Bakken with there with them and how the Bakken fits into their overall strategy for the business? Yeah, so Hess has been an interesting name. They've really reshaped their portfolio the past couple of years. They sold off a lot of different things. They sold off their Utica Shale stuff. Uh, they sold off a lot of international plays, uh, but they've kept what they think are the best. And in their case, it's the Bakken, which Shale, or Hess is one of the, the better drillers out there. They have a, a manufacturing process that they've, they've taken towards it, where they're drilling wells focused on cutting costs and really manufacturing oil out there by drilling wells that they have a high probability of delivering uh, certain production growth rates and a certain returns. So they're using those two things, uh, Bakken and Guyana as like the growth engines of the company. They think that they can grow production, um, uh, Bakken at a 15 to 20% competent annual growth rate through 2021. And they've got enough inventory to drill for about 15 years at $60 oil, higher oil prices that frees up some more inventory. So there's plenty of growth out there. They just added another rig um, earlier this year. They plan on adding another rig. So lots of growth out in the Bakken, and, and that will help them in the near term while they and ExxonMobil ramp up this Guyana find, which is just truly amazing. Um, it's got just loads and loads of oil, low cost oil out there. And so, um, Hess sees that as being the, the next gross driver, um, probably 2021, 2020, uh, when that'll come online. And, um, they think that they can grow cash flow at, um, a 10% compound annual rate for years to come. Or, I'm sorry, that's production cash flow 25%. So these two plays are just, they're so high margin. They'll produce so much money. So Hess between these two could be a really great long-term oil company. Because they can do it at sixty dollars a barrel, so um, really interesting long term name. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit more uh, about in Guyana. Um, Hess's partnership with Exxon. It, you know that relationship there, where Exxon is the operator there. Uh, how advantageous is that for Hess? I mean, it, it, that's got to be a great resource to have partnering with, with such a large oil player like Exxon. Yeah, Exxon's one of the better companies in the business at drilling for returns. They've been phenomenal over the years of um, some of the industry metrics, like um, uh, returns on capital employed, and and because they're so focused on returns, that's what benefits us here, because Exxon will invest uh, in this play because it's going to produce long-term returns and very good returns. Uh, Exxon sees this as being one of the key drivers, along with the Permian, of enabling it to double earnings by 2025, which for a company the size of Exxon, that's a huge, huge um, you know, growth potential. So for them to partner with uh, Hess, on, or for Hess to be a partner on this, it's really a, a great deal for Hess, I think, um, because Exxon just knows how to drill, knows how to produce oil. So um, I like Hess specifically because of the Bakken, but you add the two together, and it's a really nice company to follow. Exactly, and when you look at management's, uh, you know, presentations, they talk about too that that uh, Guyana and the Bakken are kind of their growth drivers, but they have some other plays that are more of their cash flow drivers that, it, that they use to kind of feed uh, those growth engines, and that, that's their their uh, assets in Malaysia and the deep water Gulf of Mexico. Um, they're saying that those uh, those plays are getting them seventy percent. 
uh, of the cash from operations through 2020, but only 20% of their capex. So these are these are things that don't require a lot of capex to keep keep uh, you know throwing off cash, but they can really use that those other uh, assets that they have to generate cash to really invest in those big growth drivers, like you mentioned uh, in Guyana and the Bakken. Right, and that's a something that investors should look at when they're looking at oil companies. Some are like Continental; they're just focused on uh, shale play. So these uh, they pump in a lot of money up front, and they they produce really fast. Then there's longer term things like offshore oil sands, LNG. They take up a lot of money up front and take and um, take years before they come online. But then they produce lots of cash and production for years to come. So that's what Guyana will be. It's a large upfront investment, but in the future, it'll turn out to be like Malaysia, like the Gulf of Mexico, where it can produce cash flow for years to come with little um, long-term investment. So that's why uh, another reason why I like Hess over a company such as Continental, because it, it does have these cash flow drivers, so it'll make more steady income over the years. Um, it just it, it kind of reduces the risk for. Uh, you know, if oil prices were to collapse again, then we'd see the Bakken shale probably um, not grow as fast, which would hurt Continental, um, but it probably wouldn't hurt uh, Hess's long-term growth plans. Sure, and then we wanted to mention too, uh, you know, for, for folks that are income investors, you know, Hess also has a midstream. Um, uh, uh, entity that you can buy shares in as a six percent yield has been growing their distribution at fifteen percent. Um, if strong financials, no debt. Uh, you want to talk about what opportunity that Hess midstream uh, vehicle might be for more income focused investors? Yeah. So if investors don't want to be exposed to oil prices, uh, Hess midstream is an interesting way to play the Bakken um, without having that exposure to oil prices. It it basically it builds. Um, Gathering pipelines, which would need to hook oil and gas wells to um, the, the country's midstream pipeline system, so it, it helps um, has to be able to get this production to um, customers, and um, it, it, it it's basically like a toll booth, and they just collect steady cash flow as these um, as these volumes flow through. So they're able to take that cash flow, reinvest some of it into building more pipelines, more processing facilities, that sort of thing, and then distributing it to shareholders. And you know, six percent in today's environment is pretty good, and it's a very safe six percent. They have no debt. They have um, they cover their dividend very well with cash flow, and um, they have lots of growth ahead because they're helping Hess with Hess growing its production fifteen uh, percent plus. That those volumes will throw flow through uh, Shell Midstream's pipelines, generating cash flow. So they think they can grow that uh, distribution by about 15% a year for the foreseeable future. Add in the potential to help third parties out, and um, I, I think it's a really interesting way to play the Bakken without getting um, all that exposure to oil. Exactly, exactly. Um, and Matt, just kind of going away, you know, we've talked about you know how we got here with the Bakken, where the Bakken is today. Looking forward into the future. You know what? Are, what are what's your view of kind of the prospects for the Bakken going forward the next five years or so, and how does the Bakken relate to the other shale plays in the United States? You know, to the Permian and other places across the country. How do you think um, the investment in the Bakken might be affected by by what happens in these other shale plays? I think um, well, there's been so much talk about the Permian Basin; it's growing so fast, too fast actually, because they've run out of pipeline room, and that's not going to be solved until next year. So, because drillage can't um, grow in the Permian, those that have assets in other areas will need to either slow down or move that capital to places like the Bakken and Eagle Ford. So, you look at a company like EOG Resources, uh, Conical Phillips, Marathon; those all own assets in multiple shale plays, including the Bakken. So we could see them move some rigs up the Bakken in the next couple of the next year at least, um, especially with how well how good the returns are up there. So I think we'll see some some shifting around to other plays just because you can't grow as fast in the Permian um, for the next year. And it just makes sense to diversify uh, because not only are there issues with pipelines, but there's issues with not having enough service um, capacity. You know, there's there aren't enough people on the ground. There aren't enough uh, pumping units, and and all those different things that go into to tracking a well. There just isn't enough of that in the Permian. So 
there is more capacity in places like the Bakken. And I, th- I think that'll draw companies because they, they'll look at returns and they'll see, hey, you know, you can get a really good return on the Bakken. Let's, let's pour some money out there. Awesome, Matt. Yeah, great stuff for our listeners. I think I think the Bakken, you know, especially as the Permian becomes becomes uh, continues to tighten, uh, it's gonna the Bakken, Bakken is going to continue to look at like a compelling oil play uh, going forward. Um, thanks for coming on, Matt. Um, anything you want to say going away for our listeners? Um, yeah, well, I think oil prices are going to be higher in the next couple of years. So I've definitely look at oil stocks. Uh, I, I think the Bakken is a good place to look at with the Permian. So. Continental has companies that own multiple shale plays. I think investors can make some money going forward. Right, and Matt, and this is probably a story we're going to continue following going forward. So you know, be happy to have you back on the show here uh, as the story continues to develop. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Matt. I want to remind our listeners, you know, check out our new and improved YouTube channel at youtube.com slash motleyfool, where we're sharing podcast clips, bonus content, and some new video content we're developing. I also remind you to follow us on Twitter at MS, MF Industry Focus. If you have any questions, um, go ahead and shoot them over to us on Twitter. Be happy to uh, talk about them on the show. As always, people on the program may own companies discussed on the show, and the Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against any of the stocks mentioned. So don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear. Thanks to Austin Morgan for his work behind the glass. For Matt Delalo, I'm Nick Seipel. Thanks for listening and full on. Thank you.